Hello, my name is Dr. Greg Mattingly. On behalf of CME and Outfitters, I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity titled Routine Screening for Depression, likely screen for hypertension. This activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians across the globe. I am the Associate Clinical Professor at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri, and President of the Midwest Research Group in St. Charles, Missouri. Today we're going to focus on evidence-based strategies to screen for depression in primary care settings. Upon completion of this activity, you should be able to effectively screen for depression in two minutes or less during routine office visits. Let me just say that five years ago, I was probably sitting and thinking exactly where each of you are today. Five years ago, I was thinking, rating scales for depression, I don't need them. I know what depression is. Rating scales for depression, rating scales are just going to take more time. I'm already busy enough. Rating scales for depression, it's going to complicate things. I don't need more complications in my life. What I've learned over the last five years is that each of those things is wrong. Rating scales helps to save me time because when I see my patient, I already have a number. I have a framework of knowing where they're coming from before I begin asking questions to see how they're doing. Using a rating scale makes my life easier because once again, I have numbers where I can track where they are over time and see if my patients are getting better. And finally, using rating scales has not only saved time, not only made things easier, but it's improved the care that I give to my patients. I'm able to do a better job taking care of my patients with depression by knowing their number and tracking it over time. So as we go through this video, let's talk about the impact that thinking about depression just like any other health condition, the difference that this can make in your patients' lives. As we all know, depression is a common condition. Each and every day within your practice, you're seeing patients struggling with depression. We know that the lifetime prevalence for depression, as you see in this slide, is between 15 to 20 percent of Americans will struggle with a major depression at some point in their life. We know that depression affects about two-thirds women, but it also affects one-third men. Not only is depression a common condition, but depression tends to be a recurrent condition. Around two-thirds of patients will go on to have future episodes of depression, and almost one out of five people with depression will grow into a chronic condition where the depression, if left untreated, doesn't go away. As we go to the next slide, we talk about not only is it common, but depression is one of the most common causes of disability here in the United States and across the globe. So when we look at this condition, we see that depression impacts lives. We see that depression causes disability in the lives of our patients during their peak earning years during the years where they want to be a mom, they want to be a dad, they want to hold a job, we see that depression is one of the most common causes of disability among any health condition. As we go to the next slide, why are we here today? Because you all in the primary care setting, my friends that are internists, my friends that are family physicians, you're at the forefront of taking care of depression. We know that about two-thirds of mental health care is provided in the primary care setting. It's something you see each and every day in your practice. So learning better strategies, learning how to take care of our patients, learning when to cross refer, but giving you simple tools so that when you're in the trenches taking care of patients, you're able to do this quickly, effectively, and improve the lives of your patients. So let's talk a little bit about some of the consequences of persistent depression. What happens if we don't treat depression? What happens if we don't help to make depression go away? We see depression causes a cost in our patients' lives. It causes a cost psychologically. It causes a cost neurologically. But in the primary care setting, it causes a cost medically and physiologically. We know that untreated depression tends to be associated with higher rates of cardiovascular disease, glucose dysregulation, vascular issues, difficulties fighting infections, autoimmune diseases, and recurrences of a number of other health conditions. 
So when we talk about depression, it's not just the impact of depression psychologically, but as you all know, you see it each and every day, it's the impact of depression physiologically and medically. If we go to the next slide and we talk about the effects of depression on overall health, we see that depression complicates everything else. If you have someone struggling with depression, what's the chance they're gonna take care of their diabetes? If you have someone struggling with depression, what's the chance they're gonna do their cardiac rehab? If you have someone struggling with depression, what do you think happens to mortality rates in cancer? So this is the point where I wanna hopefully give you some tips help to simplify things a little bit for you. We're gonna talk about routine screening of depression in the same way you would any other health condition. What, why are we talking about routine screening? Because not only is depression one of the most common health conditions, it's by far one of the most common mental health conditions. When we talk about depression, we know that screening for depression can improve outcomes. We know that in primary care settings, Nearly one in 10 patients you see each and every day are gonna be struggling with depression. So when we talk about screening, different groups around the globe, but more importantly here with the United States, have recognized the importance of improved screening for depression. So, so the good news is, in 2017, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid began paying incentives for screening for depression. We all have a lot to do, but it's great when we get reimbursed for the care we're providing. So, as of 2017, we now receive additional incentives for screening for depression in primary care settings. So let's talk about some of the assessment tools for depression. You're all used to looking at a blood pressure. You're used to checking a, a hemoglobin A1C. You know the tests. I don't need to teach you. Let's talk about the tests in depression. We have a variety of screening tools that have all been standardized, that have all been replicated, and most importantly for you, they're free to use with your patients. So these are validated tools that will help to save you time. As we look through some of the tools, we have tools that patients can fill out in the waiting room before they ever see you, where when they walk in your office, you know the number. We also have tools where you can ask a series of questions to your patient. If you have somebody you're especially worried about and you wanna ask the questions, we have those tools as well. Let's talk about some of the common screening tools for depression. So tools that I may use in a clinical trial, the MADRAS, the Montgomery Asperg Depression Rating Scale, the HAMD, the Hamilton Depression Scale, or over on the far side, the Clinical Global Impression, which is what we all do in a clinical visit. Globally, how well do I think my patient is doing? Of these tools, I'd recommend you use the CGI. The CGI is just a global measure on a scale of one to seven. Where do you think your patient is? Is your patient doing a little better, a lot better, all the way better? And you just circle the number at the end of your visit. I know our local hospital began using this as a quality measure for patients struggling with mental health conditions. My office and my partners, similarly, we use this. We like it because it's simple. It takes no additional time and it gives us an overall global measure of where our patients are at each visit. A screening tool that has a little different flavor, this is one that doesn't take any of your time, is the PHQ-9. Many of you may already be using the PHQ-9 because it's considered a screening tool in the primary care setting, a screening tool in the OB-GYN setting, a screening tool in the family medicine setting. The PHQ-9 is just the nine symptoms of depression each with a level of severity, so it checks each and every one of those symptoms. Are you sleeping? How's your appetite? How's your concentration? How's your mood? Are you having feelings of hopelessness? Have you had any suicidal thoughts? It automatically screens for each of those symptoms, and it gives you a number before you ever see your patient. So let's walk through the PHQ score. When you look at the PHQ score, this is something I want you to think when you see your patients. What's a severe level of depression? When people are in the teens to low 20s, those are patients you should be worried about. Those are patients that are gonna probably need more active intervention. Maybe referral to a counselor in your community, maybe referral to a community mental health center, or maybe somebody you wanna see back a little more frequently, because these people have pretty severe depression. In those moderate ranges, 
we see in the low teens, 10, 15, 16. That's where a lot of your patients are going to come in. They're depressed. They're not suicidal. But they're struggling and not functioning well. At that level of depression, your patients are going to come in. They're going to be struggling meeting their daily commitments. They're going to be struggling tolerating stress. It's the person that comes in asking for a work note because they're falling apart at work. They're also the patients that are going to be coming in with physical symptoms of depression. Headaches, hypertension, my blood sugar is out of control, I can't sleep. So that moderate range is going to be the sweet spot where most of your patients are ranging. What we look for is, can we with active treatment get them down into the, I'm doing pretty well, I'm back to normal, or I'm only having very mild symptoms. That's the goal of treatment as we use the PHQ-9. So why do I like it? It's free. It's easy to use. It takes none of our time. The patients fill it out before they ever see us. And most importantly, it gives you a number. It gives you a number of where your patients are as you track to see, have I gotten them back to where they should be? So let's talk about some goals of treatment. Some of the SMART goals of treatment are using a rating scale in the same way you would for any other health condition. Using this number to make sure you've gotten your patients back to the lives they want to be living. Why do we love this tool? Because once again, it's replicated in pretty much every mental health setting and every primary care setting. It helps to guide your treatment. It helps to save time. And it helps to make you a better clinician for your patients. Thank you for joining us for today's medical education activity. And most importantly, I hope you've learned a few things that'll help you next week when you're in the clinic taking care of your patients. Good evening.